everyone. Bon après-midi to Mons. Uh, good morning for those of you who are further west. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and your participation today in the webinar in the face of the, the cur current COVID-19 situation. I hope everyone is staying safe. Uh, so Canada's climate change adaptation platform is pleased to facilitate today's webinar, the Mayor's Roundtable on Climate Change. That's Bill New Brunswick. And we have a great speaker today. Uh, Adam Cheeseman lives in Sacramentville, New Brunswick, and participates on the Mayor's Roundtable on Climate Change as a community member. Adam works as a Director of Conservation with Nature NV, an organization whose mandate is to celebrate, conserve, and protect New Brunswick's natural heritage through education, networking, and collaboration. Adam manages Nature NV's Climate Change Adaptation Project, which focus on building capacity and expertise for nature-based adaptation approaches in Maritime Canada. Adam has also worked as a part-time faculty member at Mount Allison University and as a researcher with the Education for Sustainability Research Group at Dalhousie University. Adam holds a BSc in Environmental Science from Mount Allison University and a Master of Environmental Studies from Dalhousie University. Adam is also speaking on behalf of Jamie Burke, who is the Senior Manager of Corporate Projects for the Town of Sackville, New Brunswick. Jamie could not join us today due to a necessary focus on the town's response. So, double thanks to Adam for stepping in for, for both of you. So this webinar will provide a brief introduction to the Sackville community. The roundtable structure and key activities, such as developing a climate lens, organizing public forums, as well as insight into how this model could be adapted in other communities. Participants can expect to learn about how this unique initiative took root and what current challenges and opportunities exist for advancing climate action in communities like Sackville. So as I mentioned before, um, the audio for this webinar is only available on the teleconference line. Uh, we apologize for the inconvenience and I hope you didn't have to try too many times to dial in today. Hope you've all made it. Um, during the webinar, we invite you to write your questions uh, in the space in the chat box on the left. Vous pouvez afficher vos questions en français et nous y répondre après le webinar. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and if there's questions that we're not able to get to, we can provide a written response uh, following the webinar. The webinar today will be recorded, and it will be available for viewing a day or two afterwards, and we will share that URL by email. So without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Adam. Perfect. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining and kind of echo, want to echo what Catherine said. Thank you everyone for coming under such unprecedented times that we all find ourselves in. So thanks very much for participating. And um, as Catherine mentioned, my name is Adam Sheetson. I, I live uh, in Sackville, New Brunswick, uh, where we're going to kind of focus the conversation around today. Um, and I work for an organization called Nature and Beauty, um, which I'll introduce in a moment as well. Um, I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm presenting this webinar from, as we have mentioned, Sackville, New Brunswick, which is on the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people, uh, members of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And I, yeah, again, just want to recognize um, kind of the unprecedented times that we're in, and thank you all for being here, and hope that you're all doing well um, with all of this. So I also just want to thank, of course, NRCAN and the Climate Earth Institute for inviting us to talk about as the initiative. It's a relatively new initiative that we have happening here in, in Sackville, and it's something that uh, you know, we're happy to share information on. It, it might you know, help your own community or uh, inform some of the work that you're doing. So um, really goal is, is to share information about the approach that we've taken in forming this Mayor's Roundtable on Climate Change, what it's all about, uh, what we're up to, um, and hopefully some that can be relevant in, in some of the work you're doing either professionally or in your own community personally. So just to give um, a quick overview of where we're going to go today, um, first I'll start off um, introducing the town of Sackville, a little bit about who we are and what we're up to, um, as well as some of the impacts from climate change that we're currently facing and we expect to face uh, more of in the future. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about some of the actions the town has taken and a lot of the community groups uh, within the town have taken to start to address some of these impacts and focus on adaptation and mitigation. Uh, we'll talk about some ongoing challenges um, and some new up-and-coming challenges at the municipal level um, for getting this work done. Um, and then I'll start talking more specifically about the roundtable 
um, provide an overview of the structure, what duties we've uh, come together to achieve, and what our timelines are, and what we hope to do in the future. And then we'll probably have quite a bit of time for, for questions and answers. So hopefully that will be uh, helpful as well. So I just want to introduce uh, the organization that I work for as well, so uh, the Trendy. So we are um, a not-for-profit charitable organization, and we work to celebrate, uh, conserve, and protect New Brunswick's natural heritage. Um, and so our history is actually through a federation of the various nature clubs and natural clubs from around the province. Um, so we came together to be uh, an organization in the 1970s, again, as that kind of um, aggregation of all the nature clubs around the province and so historically we focused a lot on education um, and networking and collaboration with other um, NGOs and other groups and municipalities across the province and um, more recently in, in the last few years we've really started to focus on climate change um, as a core aspect of the work that we do in celebrating conserving and protecting uh, New Brunswick's natural heritage. So from the climate change perspective, what our organization really focuses on um, and is, is really focused on advancing nature-based solutions um, to climate change. And so because we're rooted in this idea of celebrating and conserving nature, um, that was kind of a, an obvious choice for us and, and a big focus for us. And so what we do a lot of is, is educate um, different groups about uh, nature-based adaptation approaches and solutions, whether it be living shorelines or conservation of uh, wetlands and forests and the headwaters of watersheds um, and also hybrid approaches, so approaches that we could take that adopt kind of both that engineering approach but also that, that, that nature-based approach. Um, so a lot of what we do is we also collaborate with uh, different organizations to host professional development workshops. We've done a lot of in-field visits to um, different nature-based adaptation projects. Um, and more and more, we're working to really put an emphasis on building the capacity of different uh, special groups like engineers and planners and NGOs to do some of this work. Um, and so we're actually working very closely with the New Brunswick Environmental Network with some funding through NRK and through the BRACE program um, to deliver that initiative here in New Brunswick. Um, and so that's a little bit kind of our focus at an organization level on climate change adaptation. And we're also involved in a lot of work locally here um, in southeast New Brunswick and in the Chicago Isthmus. Uh, which is the, the, the land bridge that connects um, New Brunswick with Nova Scotia. So, I just want to introduce now the community of Sackville and, and what we're all about, where we are specifically. So for those who aren't familiar, are as familiar with New Brunswick or the Maritime, um, Sackville is located in the southwest corner, sorry, southeast corner of the province. Um, we're about a 10 minute drive from the Nova Scotia border. Um, and we're right um, situated at the very upper limits of the Bay of Fundy and the Cumberland Basin. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, um, the community is in the traditional territory of the Big Black people. Um, our population is around 5,000 people when our university students are in town, um, and it shrinks to about uh, around 3,000 when they're not. Um, so Sackville is the home of, of Mount Alston University, um, which is a liberal arts uh, university. Um, it's situated directly in the town. There's a lot of integration between the town and the university. And so one of the big, um, big, big components of our community is really that town-gown relationship between the university and the town. Um, we have a lot of small businesses that um, rely on the university and the university relies on as well. Um, we're also an agricultural community and an arts and cultural community as well. And we are referred to as, as the crossroads of the maritime. So we're about two hours away from a lot of the um, uh, the larger centers in in the Maritime, including you know, Bathurst, Fredericton, St. John, Halifax, Charlottetown. Um, so we're, it's a really interesting area that we're in and also um, a really kind of diverse crowd of folks who call uh, Sackville home. And as I mentioned, um, this is just a, a satellite image of, of the community and you can see here that the, the Bay of Fundy and the Cumberland Basin come in. You can see um, the Nova Scotia, New Brunswick border um, near the right-hand side of the image, and then the, the town of Amherst on, uh, on the right-hand side as well, just a little bit to the east of Sackville. Um, so we're located directly along the Bay of Fundy, and so we actually have experience some of the highest tides in the world, um, and we have a number of rivers that run directly into the Bay of Fundy that go in or around the community. And as many of you are probably aware, um, we have a network of dikes that actually protect um, 
both Sackville and Amherst and the other smaller communities as well as our agriculture community, as well as our trade corridor. So the Trans-Canada Highway, as you can see in the map, goes directly across uh, the Tanchmar Marsh, um, which is protected by a, a network of dikes that were historically uh, built by the Acadians. Um, and so the idea was to drain um, the water off of the land using the dikes and convert it to agriculture. So that um, process and, and then the settlement patterns that followed that have led us to really rely on those dikes um, to manage issues like coastal flooding as well as inland flooding. And we'll get back to that um, in a little bit. And so the dikes, of course, protect the communities. They also protect a really, really important trade corridor and being the, the main connection, uh, land-based connection between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And so it's estimated that um, around $50 million a day of trade goes um, across that highway and it's between our two uh, communities. And of course, the agricultural land component is a big, compo- uh, big portion of, of, of the concern here in this area as well um, in maintaining that, that industry and those livelihoods as well. That's just a little bit about that. Uh, so in Sackville and the surrounding area, we also have a long history of, of flooding. Um, and so it's all about water, water, water here. And so we have a long history of, of storm events and flooding, um, both from the coastal perspective and the inland perspective. So I mentioned the dikes earlier, and for those who don't know, but what's interesting about the dikes is that they have a one-way gate, which is called the Abwato. And the Abwato allows water to drain off of the landscape into the bay at low tide. So it's a one-way gate, so the fresh water comes to the dike and it goes out through that gate. At high tide, though, because it's a one-way gate, that gate's actually closed. So as the water rushes down towards the dike through our communities, we have, it's unable to actually go through the dike and into the bay um, when that high tide is up against the gate. And so what we get there is a lot of issues with freshwater flooding. Um, so we have kind of both of those concerns um, happening in, in the Sackville area and some of the other communities as well. And so just to give a sense too, one, one of the big storms that I think I've talked about a lot um, in and around the area, when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about extreme weather, the Saxby Gale. Um, the Saxby Gale occurred in uh, 1869, in October of 1869. It was a tropical cyclone storm um, that came directly up through the Bay of Fundy. And some of the winds that were recorded in and around Saxville uh, were exceeding 160 kilometers an hour wind. Um, it also happened in an extreme high tide, which caused a two meter storm surge, which severely impacted the agriculture community. Um, loss of life, um, the dike system, and the two communities, Amherst and Sackville, as well as the, the other um, areas in, 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 in and around the Tanchamar Marshes. So we have a long history of flooding, so it's something that is really top of mind for the community members, and so in the context of climate change, um, there's a lot of conversation that happens around this, um, in and around this area. So in terms of other impacts, of course, we talked about freshwater and coastal flooding, um, obviously, sea level rise is a concern, especially um, given that the dikes, you know, were constructed originally with sea level rise in mind. So that uh, there's a lot of work, and we'll talk about this a little bit later too, going into you know what is our dike system going to look like in the long term with sea level rise uh, and more extreme weather events. Um, we saw last September um, our susceptibility to increased hurricane risk, um, either coming up the Atlantic seaboard or directly into the Bay of Fundy. Um, so the mayor time hit by Hurricane Dorian, as many of you are probably familiar with, um, earlier in September, which caused significant damage um, in and around Sackville and in a lot of our surrounding communities in Southeast New Brunswick and in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. And so there's a lot of attention kind of being focused to those extreme weather events as well. And in addition to that, we're also you know experiencing more severe winter storms um, in the last few years as part of the corporate adaptation um, plan and in coordination with the town of Amherst and other um, stakeholders, we the town was able to implement um, a highway closure protocol. So when there are really stiff winds, uh, which tend to be the norm in, in our area, going blowing across the Tanchamar Marsh, especially the blizzard conditions, we'll, we'll see highway closures and we'll see, see these measures put in place. And so that's another uh, concern to the community. So um, you know, for people who are trying to get across the border, or especially for those uh, truck drivers who are supposed to be getting across the border to look at the trade or the train, um, there's there's lots of conversations and action happening on kind of both ends of the march um, around how we deal with those issues. And of course, like many other places, we're dealing with warmer, wetter winters as well, which is uh, bringing uh, additional impact. So those are some of, some of the many impacts that 
you know, the community is facing um, in terms of climate change. And so, all in all, we're, we're relatively susceptible to, to the challenges related to climate change. Um, we've been identified as a region, um, you know, where there's a very high risk uh, in the context of climate change globally. Um, and so, in this these series of images, you can see a couple of reasons why that is. So, in the bottom left, we see, um, you know, a storm and a high tide event coming right up to the railway track. The transit of the highway is actually just right below the railway track there. So, in some cases, that railway track, which was built on an old dike, is, is really protecting that, that trade corridor and our communities um, from coastal flooding during uh, storm events. And you can see other examples of this as well in, in the bottom right with our freshwater flooding context, which is a, a concern for the community as well. But action's also happening. Um, so from research, uh, partnering with local and, and regional universities, to on-the-ground projects, and much more, there's a lot that's going on in Sackville. So um, there's, there's a lot that we can learn from and a lot that we can draw on in terms of uh, what's already been happening. And that, for, um, from our perspective, that was a real big um, push for why did this roundtable on climate change started to become a thing. And so just to get a sense of some of the actions that have taken place, um, in the area, so one of the big components that was a big driver behind the roundtable, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, were the youth climate strikes. So the, in coordination with the middle school students and the high school students and the university students, they started to self-organize around um, as Greta Thunberg's um, climate marches became more and more prominent globally. And a number of climate strikes have occurred directly in our town. Um, involving the middle school, the high school, and the university students. Um, and so from that, there's also been a group, the Sackley Climate Change Coalition, which is formed um, with adult support, um, providing they have their own website, they have um, lots of events and different climate strikes, and for each strike they actually prepare different letters of action for different levels of government um, that they're asking uh, for different types of action on climate change. And that is really, really what's big driving force of the roundtable, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, in a bit. Um, we're also unique and, and an interesting perspective from having a university in town. So the Mount Allison Student Union actually, um, a number of years ago, instituted a levy um, on students. So as part of your tuition as a Mount Allison student, you contribute $10 towards a green investment fund every year. And so then the MAFU distributes that fund um, through a proposal process to students, researchers, NGOs, uh, community groups, municipalities, etc. Um, and they're all focused on projects that help to reduce CO2 emissions in the Sackville area, but also in the Tanchamar region, Southeast New Brunswick region more broadly. Um, so that's a unique initiative that we have happening in, in the community as well. And we also have uh, our Shikento Climate Change Collaborative, which it includes um, representatives from both the New Brunswick side and the Nova Scotia side of the border um, of the whole region, um, not just Sackville that really, really focuses on, you know, what are the, what are the high-level issues that, that we're expected to face? What can we do about them? So it's, it's a group that's comprised of over 80 representatives from everything from emergency measures to fire departments to nonprofit organizations. Um, and it's coordinated by EOS Eco Energy, which is a, a small nonprofit here in Sackville as well. And the uh, Collaborative collaborates on, on a variety of different projects. They host annual workshops around um, flood risk, um, and all different types of things. And so it's a real diverse group and it's a real asset in our community as well. And so this is just an image of a few people who are involved in, in the collaborative. Um, and in 2020, for instance, we were uh, invited to change from regional high school in Sackville to do an education learning day with all the high school students. So we had about 400 high school students that we interacted with to talk to them about climate change, um, how they felt about it, and to share information on some of the actions that were taking place in the region. So again, um, some more action on that front through the collaborative. And the town has also taken quite a bit of leadership and partnership with uh, many other folks um, in the region. Um, one you know, project that I want to highlight a little bit is, is our recent stormwater plant project. Um, so as we can see in the image here, um, what you're doing in this image is looking down uh, Wellington Street onto Lawrence Street, uh, which runs perpendicular, and you can see during um, you know, regular um, heavy rainfall events, the street was, was very, very heavily flooded, and it includes a lot of recreation infrastructure in the town, like um, ball diamonds, but also a number of private businesses um, 
and industry that um, is consistently inundated um, or was on a regular basis during a heavy rainfall event. And so as part of that process, uh, the town was interested in looking at how to address that issue um, and looked at the, the storm, naturalized stormwater problems as, as one approach. And so I'll talk about that in a couple of moments. We also, there's a ongoing trade corridor project being led by the federal government, uh, government of New Brunswick and the government of Nova Scotia, looking at options for, for the dike plans looking into the future. Um, and we also have a number of planning um, documents that have been prepared that focus on climate change, mitigation and adaptation, um, ranging from a corporate adaptation plan, which uh, includes an implementation plan for different actions that the town can take uh, to protect the municipality from um, the different climate impacts that we're expecting. Um, we have an integrated community sustainability plan, which many other communities across Canada have, um, which really focuses on climate change, but also on other um, pro-environmental initiatives. And we're part of the Partners for Climate Protection Program, um, which focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions at the municipal level. So, as I mentioned, there's, there's, there's quite a few things going on. Um, but even more recently, what we've seen is more of these kinds of, kind of on-the-ground focus for, you know, how are we going to start to address some of these concerns? And so we saw this over the last couple of years with the town developing a naturalized stormwater pond project. And so what you can see here is an image of the pond construction. Um, it was actually phase two of a multi-phase project. Phase one involved upgrading a lot of the sewer um, and stormwater infrastructure on the Long Street itself. Um, and the very interesting thing about the stormwater pond is that the town didn't just want to build a water jail. So the community was really adamant. They didn't want to just have this area cleared and dug out with a pile of rocks on the bottom so that water could sit there and quickly drain to the ground. They wanted to have something the community could use, and they wanted to have something that would be um, valuable, um, not only for us, but also for wildlife. And so what we saw was a lot of consultation, a lot of work to incorporate natural features into this project. Um, and now when we look, this is the aftershot of the pond um, and what it looks like today. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, we have a number of, uh, of drainage ditches that have been included. Um, they also did a lot of work and care to, to preserve islands of trees and biodiversity so that they were digging around these areas um, so you could still have enough capacity to deal with about a third of the flood problem um, coming from the freshwater flooding side in Sackville, um, while also um, adding to the recreation trail system and network um, and, and maintaining quite a bit of biodiversity in that area. And so this has been a really successful project and one that has been um, accepted by the community, I would say, at, at a really high level. And of course, with all of this, um, there comes a number of challenges with with our municipality and our community when it comes to climate change. So yeah, I, you know, I mentioned a lot of different actions that, that we've been up to, uh, but there's also these ongoing challenges. And so at the community level, um, one of the big ones right now is thinking about um, our municipal elections. As um, many of you are familiar with, this can lead to you know, changes and shifts in, in how the community moves on different issues. Um, and so our elections were slated to take place um, this in the next couple of months. Um, due to the COVID-19 situation, the province has postponed the elections until 2021. Um, but it's still something that's at top of mind for our group, um, especially because, as you notice by the title of the talk, and when I start talking about the roundtable, we'll get into this a little bit more, um, but really the roundtable is focused on the mayor, and it's really about reporting directly to the mayor. Um, our mayor is not going to be re-offering um, for uh, the next uh, seat of election, and so that's something that we have in top of mind in terms of what's our group going to look like, and there's a little bit of uncertainty and a little bit of risk there in terms of our group um, and what its role is going to be um, on town council and, and, and liaising with town council uh, in the future. Um, there's also communication education. So there's a lot of um, work that needs to go into, you know, continually engaging and educating and communicating with the various different groups uh, that we have in our community to make sure that everybody's on board and that everyone has an opportunity to share what they would like the town to do um, in the context of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, being a small town um, with a lot of different diverse groups, um, you'd expect sometimes that it, it might be easy to elicit everyone's advice uh, but that's not always the case, and so that continues to be a challenge, making sure that we're trying to reach out to as many different groups as possible to get as much feedback as possible. Um, we also, given that we're a small town, we have a limited budget. So running on a small um, municipal budget, we're very reliant on ex 
external funding for major projects. So the stormwater project that I just talked about um, was funded both with uh, provincial and federal dollars. And so it's really, um, although the town has plans to, to expand the capacity of these stormwater pond systems to deal with all the freshwater flooding issues in fact, so, um, that that funding arrangement um, is, is a challenge given that um, you know we can't simply allocate all of our capital budget to one project in a given year. Um, and that, that would be the case if we were to expand the capacity of those projects. Um, so that, that's a challenge in and of itself. Um, we're also, you know, outside of directly of municipal boundaries, we're, we're impacted quite significantly by external factors that are outside of our jurisdiction. Um, so things like the dikes and the by marsh and, and the rail lines and the highway and these sorts of things that our community really relies on. Um, and we have some, some stake in, but um, it does fall out of the jurisdiction of the town itself. Um, so, you know, continuing to collaborate and connect with those um, folks who are responsible for those initiatives and those uh, pieces of infrastructure is, is really important as well. And in the context of challenges as well, there was at the town council and, and municipal level this is need to figure out how do we respond to these ongoing climate strikes. So our, our students and our youth are really out on their uh, out in the streets asking for more climate action and what, what are we going to do about that? How do we um, you know, structure things and lay a foundation so we can have a positive uh, moment moving forward in, in response to these strikes. And so that is really what led to the formation of, uh, of the Mayor's Roundtable on Climate Change. So I'm just going to transition into now talking more about um, that initiative specifically in the context of the town and what form that's taken. And so what we can see is this progression of our, of our timeline. So this is starting in 2019. Um, we had a number of different um, things come into place. Um, the biggest one was our March 15th uh, climate strike with the um, Tackle Youth Climate Change Coalition. And so the Tackle Youth Climate Change Coalition, as I mentioned, um, is a group that um, has come together from the middle school, the high school, and the university to organize climate strikes. And so on March 15th, they um, participated in a, in a very large strike that, that really caught the attention. And they, they had specific asks for the municipality around what we were doing in town around climate change. And so from that, um, moving into April, the next council meeting, there was a recognition at council meeting that there was uh, a need for further action um, related to climate change. And so from that, this idea about having a roundtable um, came to be. And so after a few months of kind of putting together the ideas and the structure, um, we had our first meeting in the roundtable in September of last year. And September of last year was a really interesting meeting and a really interesting point, uh, um, given that in, in late September there was there was the large climate strike uh, that happened world worldwide. And so that was a really great way for us to kind of start off on the right foot and to understand and to start to get a sense of what, what we're here to do and what we're here for. And so after that first meeting, which was really about scoping out, uh, you know, what is this going to look like, um, one of the big things that came out of that was the need for youth to have a voice in providing projects and different ideas to the town. And so the idea of hosting a youth forum was proposed um, and was organized by the Mount Austin Student Union Sustainability Committee. Uh, so they had a room on campus where they invited all ages of youth to come and present on different projects that, that they would like the town to, to undertake. And so I'll talk a little bit more about the outcomes of that forum a little bit later on. And then moving into uh, the end of last year, uh, we were having more meetings to talk about the capital budget. So one of the big reasons that the roundtable was formed was to review the capital budget, to consider different projects that could um, either have a climate lens on them or projects that could be uh, could be directly funded by the capital budget that would help us prepare for or mitigate uh, different levels of climate change impact. And we also started to develop plans for a public forum. So similar to youth forum, we were hoping to invite the community out to hear from them um, what they would like to see the town move forward on. And finally, given the challenges that I talked about before with um, you know with the elections and turnover and things like that, we really needed to explore longevity and how we were going to keep this, this roundtable going um, post election period. And so, moving into 2020, um, what we saw was that we had a, um, in December we had a review. 
review of capital project budgets. And so we had a subgroup of the round table actually sit down with the town, go through the capital budget with a climate lens and say, you know, maybe we want to think about adjusting this project in this way um, to you know, either lessen its impact or create a positive impact um, on reducing the impact of climate change. And so in February, um, we hosted our first public forum on climate change. Uh, we had over 70 participants come from across the community, um, and we accepted both written and oral submissions. And so this is a one-day, one-afternoon event. Um, we had a number of amazing oral submissions from, from across the community. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a bit as well. Um, and we had a huge, huge level of engagement from the town. And so moving forward um, into where we are now, we've split and we've established two subgroups off of the main group of the round table, one of which is focused on taking the information from the public forum and looking at it and thinking about, you know, what, what can we recommend as, as, you know, concrete actions that the round table can take? Um, and also, what's the long-term sustainability going to look like for our group? And how are we going to keep things going again this, this post-election cycle? And so just to talk a little bit about the structure of the roundtable itself, as I mentioned, we've met a number of times um, over the course of uh, later in 2019 into 2020, um, and the structure is really one um, that's unique. And so a lot of care and time was put into thinking about, you know, who did we want to invite to have on this roundtable and how can we have, you know, good representation from, from different sectors. And so we have a number of different representatives, including uh, youth, uh, community representatives, Nonprofit representatives, representatives from the agriculture community, from the university community, um, elected officials, not elected government officials, local business, um, and so we're really trying to expand that that net of, of people that we can include in the roundtable to try and get as many different perspectives as possible um, in terms of how we mitigate and adapt to climate change at our community level. And so again. The, the overall duties on the roundtable was first form was, you know, primarily to look at these three tasks. So how can we review the capital budget on a regular basis um, by using a climate lens and inform how different projects that are going to be proposed can um, have a reduced impact, uh, but also how some projects can have a positive impact. Looking at hosting these forums to elicit feedback and get advice, um, and also exploring that, that, that longer-term sustainability of the group. And so I'll just talk about each one of those a little bit just to give you a sense of, of what they included. And it might give some ideas about, um, you know, if you were to propose this type of initiative in your community, uh, what it could look like. And so for us, what, what, what I found uh, one, one of the more interesting pieces of the roundtable so far has been the capital budget review. And so there was a subgroup of folks um, from the roundtable who began to focus on reviewing the capital budget, um, and they developed this idea of a climate lens. And so similar to, um, you know, the climate lens, for example, that Infrastructure Canada has developed, really the idea was looking at, you know, key areas and thinking about how different um, ideas and projects that are proposed in the capital budget matched up with that lens. So it was decided by the subgroup that these um, characteristics listed on the slide were going to be the, the main focus of the climate lens. So the we were interested in how can projects increase the number of trees um, in the community, how can we reduce energy expenditures, how can we increase our dike integrity, um, how can we increase natural assets and natural infrastructure in the community, so how can we incorporate natural features and nature-based adaptation into some of this work, how can we encourage more communication and education in the community about climate change generally, um, and how can some of these capital projects that may or may not focus on climate change also provide a co-benefit for the environment more generally. And so just to give a couple of examples of that, um, how it actually played out in, in, in reality, um, we have a proposal um, at a town level to develop a dog park. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of interest in the community having a, a dog park, an area where people can specifically go with their dogs that's fenced in. Um, and the proposal at the time was to have the, the dog park at Beach Hill Park, which is a little bit outside of town an eight kilometer, 10 kilometer drive from the, the core of downtown. And so when reviewing that project, what came up was, oh, well, maybe we want to rethink that. Do we really want people having to get their dogs in their cars and drive out to Beach Hill Park to use the dog park? Or do we want to have the dog park somewhere more centrally located within town that people could walk to, to again, reduce energy expenditures? 
another piece around the dog park was the idea of um, you know recommending to the town they incorporate natural features into the dog park. So instead of you know redeveloping a natural area that would that would suit uh, the dog park, maybe trying to select a natural area that could be um, you know augmented slightly um, to facilitate that. Um, so these are things like not constructing new parking lots and then things like this. Um, another example was moving away from paving gravel parking lots. There was a number of projects in the capital budget that was to be focused on uh, repaving or paving gravel parking lots. Um, and so, you know, the round table was able to suggest, well, you know, gravel parking lots and these types of areas um, can help to reduce the amount of stormwater that's being produced um, in the town and the community itself. So maybe this is not an area where we want to invest our dollars um, at this time. And so providing more advice on that and more uh, interest. And another third uh, piece, there were many other recommendations, but I was just pulling out a couple that I thought were of interest. And the, the other one was the solar reserve fund. So there was an idea around, you know, how can we, within the capital budget, maybe take a little bit of um, a little bit of the capital budget every year um, into what's called a solar reserve fund. That if there was going to be you know, a bulk purchase of a number of solar panels to be installed in the municipal buildings, for example, then that reserve fund over time could slowly accumulate some of that funding as opposed to just spending you know, a large portion of the capital budget just on that one project um, in any given year. And that was one that was you know, a really, really important one for us given the, um, the size and the scope of the community in terms of the size of the budget that we do have. Oh, I mean, the slide might have been might not load, but I will talk about what was on it. Uh, I'll just give the next one for you. So I just also wanted to share a little bit more information about the forum that we held. Um, and so with the public forum, as well as the youth forum. And so the youth forum, as I mentioned, was hosted before the holidays. It was held at Mount Alpha University. and was organized specifically for youth in the community to come and share ideas that they had about climate change uh, with the community. And so really it was trying to answer the question, what can faculty do to help adapt and mitigate to climate change in, the, in our in our community? And so there was a number of youth who gave presentations um, around everything related to reducing single use plastics, the stronger waste management guidelines, to encouraging the town to plant more trees and developing um, a forest management plan for the community. Um, there was also this interesting idea of developing a standing committee on climate change. So unlike the round table, which would advise um, you know the town in terms of working directly with the mayor and reporting to the mayor, um, this standing committee would actually focus more on, at the broader community level, um, what sorts of initiatives and, and direction and education can we focus on um, in the community itself. And at the public forum on February 1st, uh, we heard again from over 10 uh, different submissions, both written and oral submissions, from places like the Insurance Bureau of Canada, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, from poets in the community, from environmental consultants and biologists, uh, university professors, lots and lots of different folks with lots of different perspectives on what they can and can do to adapt and to mitigate to climate change. And one of the big takeaways from this um, was really a focus on developing um, staff capacity to, to, at the municipal level to focus on, on climate change adaptation and mitigation. And so really a lot of these presentations emphasize the need for something like a climate change coordinator or a climate or a a climate change staff member on uh, municipal staff that would have time dedicated to focusing um, on implementing all the various recommendations that were um, proposed at both the youth forum and the public forum. And so these other initiatives that were proposed like, um, were EV charging stations, um, focusing on public art and murals, and that's one piece that the town has taken action on. We currently have uh, $25,000 um, in our budget for 2020 that's going to go towards the public art installation in town that has a climate change focus. Um, there was also a big emphasis on public forum on tree planting, um, on looking at energy efficiency lights and dark sky preserve status for the community, a zero waste store and reducing plastics, and again, stricter waste management criteria. So really, the, it ran the gambit in terms of different recommendations that were coming from the community, uh, but a big emphasis on leaving that staff capacity to explore these and to see what's viable. And moving into the next piece of long-term sustainability, as I mentioned before, we also have a subgroup now who's looking at various models 
um, of how the roundtable could continue into the future. So at present, as I mentioned, we are uh, a diverse group of community representatives who report directly to the mayor. Um, we're not um, reporting to town council at this time, for example, or to the broader community. Um, so we're exploring all those different methods as ways to make sure that we can be the most impactful in the community, but we can also uh, be able to establish ourselves in the long term. So we've actually engaged um, a specialist in the community who is very knowledgeable about organizational capacity building. Um, and so we have a subgroup of folks looking at what the most appropriate model would be, um, given that we want to remain permanent and pertinent to the town um, and all of our activities that we do. And so moving forward, really, we have these two big questions. Um, how are we going to adjust post-election, um, and how is the group going to be structured? Um, and other big question that we're working with right now is what specific actions and recommendations do we want to take to the town that came from the public forum or the youth forum? And this is a really important piece, that there's many, um, you know, what we found is that there's a lot of presentations at the public forum and the youth forum that focus on really high-level um, climate change um, action. Things like, you know, we need to mobilize the community, we need uh, more education, we need an all hands on deck approach, and then really specific recommendations, like I think we need an EV charger um, at the parking lot beside the post office. So how do we balance those different recommendations and weigh them appropriately in, in, in a concrete package that we can present to the mayor and present to the town council and say, you know, these are the most important uh, recommendations and the ones that will have the most impact, we think. And so overall, um, just to summarize, you know, the lessons learned from this initiative, and we're going to have a short polling question as well as coming up here, which is going to ask a couple of questions about opportunities for uh, climate action at your own community level. Um, but just as you think about that question, um, in terms of lessons learned, again, that, that staff capacity is key for us um, in terms of the recommendations. We're, we need that staff capacity to look at the recommendations we're going to be proposing uh, to maintain action. Uh, we've also found, again, the climate lens, um, and just thinking about different projects and thinking about um, all of the broad different responsibilities that a municipality has um, in its capital budget, but also in its operating budget, and how each one of those different projects can, um, can have a climate lens put on them to make sure that they're not providing um, undue impact or that they can actually be beneficial. And, of course, the long-term sustainability aspect is also something that, that we've learned that needs to be considered from the outset. Um, and it's something that we've been having conversations about um, since the beginning of the project. And so, yeah, we invite you, of course, to answer these questions. So, you know, what opportunities exist for climate change at your own local level? You know, thinking about some of the things that I've talked about, but also thinking about, you know, your work, but also your own community. You know, what, what opportunities do you see for climate action? And, and what are some of the barriers that might impede this, this type of initiative in, in your community? Here, I'm starting to have some come in. So coastal development, um, flood line mapping, tree planting uh, to mitigate flooding. So those are all really good actions. Um, and I think in terms of the barriers that are coming up right now, um, you know, the, the political will and council support is something that I think that currently in fact we, we do have um, at, at a broad scale. And I think that's that big concern about the long-term sustainability and making sure that we can keep that going. Um, in, in the long run. Yeah, definitely the local leaders growing tired over time with no one to replace them as well. Um, and lack of community mobilization and, and these sorts of things as well. I think that that's an important barrier as well and something that can maybe be overcome by some of these um, initiatives and, and really just starting to ask the community to get more involved um, in these good types of work. And people concerns about the, the flood line and flood mapping is definitely something that we experienced and it's something that a conversation that takes a long time. But I think given that Sackville had a long history of dealing with flood risk and, and, and you know, prior to this group being established, there was a lot of flood mapping done and it was shared with the community really broadly. I think that there is that, that general level of acceptance. So um, that's an interesting perspective as well. Great. So I'll just wrap up there and feel free to keep contributing, I guess, poll questions and i um, happy to answer any of the questions that are coming up in the chat as well. So thank you everyone for, for listening and I hope that was uh, at least a little bit helpful for folks. Great. Thank you very much, Adam. That was very informative. Really
liked how you took us through the whole journey going from impact to the actual adaptation actions that you're taking and gave some great concrete examples that others can learn from. So we do have uh, one question in the chat box uh, so far from Kate saying, how do the suggestions in the public and youth forum compare? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very interesting question. There were some overlaps. Um, so we found with the youth forum, um, oh, you know, there was, there was a lot of focus on plastics um, and waste management and so things that you know, can contribute to climate change, of course. Um, and so those, those were a little bit shared with the public forum. Um, but I'd say that the big difference between the two, um, the youth forum, and this is really interesting, and we found this with a lot of the youth work that we've been involved with over the past um, few years around climate change, is really youth want answers and they want projects now. So when, when we ask youth to, to provide us with some of the, the information about what they want to see the town do, it's really, really concrete. You know, they want to see... Um, us reduce our plastic waste. We want to see us have uh, three stream, uh, so compost, recycling, and, and landfill garbage um, at all of our businesses and all of our apartment buildings, which we don't currently have. Um, they want to see more trees going on the ground. They want to see concrete action. Um, at the public forum level, we had a little bit of a mix. So we had that kind of higher level um, um, support for um, things like you know, needing more climate change action, um, developing, you know, training and education tools for municipal counselors and things that are a little bit more higher level um, and a little bit more long term. And we did have some of those specific actions as well that came out, but I would say that would be the biggest difference. Great. Thank you. We have another question from Olivia. The climate lens that you mentioned, is that a rubric or document that you could use to score the projects at all? If so, would it be possible to send a copy to see what your municipality uses? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. So the climate lens um, doesn't necessarily score projects um, at a quantitative level. We, the climate lens was essentially used as a tool to have those different criteria. Maybe I can go back to that. Well, I don't see things like that. Um, so it was to use the criteria um, to look at the various different projects that could be um, focused on. And so using that criteria, what really came out of it was um, not necessarily quantifying different projects, but just using it as a lens to look at it. So with a dog park, for example, is okay, how can the dog park be used to increase the amount of trees that we have in the community? How can the dog park be used to decrease our, en and our energy expenditures. And so it was almost, um, you know, rot rank quantitatively, but looking at each one of those criteria on each one of the projects. And um, I can check in to see if, if we can share that um, as well. So um, feel free to, or maybe, yeah, I can put my email back up at the front. Um, if you wanted to send me an email, I can see if we're able to share that, that framework that we've developed. And so if anybody's interested in that, I can get back to you for sure. Great. Thanks, Adam. And we can probably share things through the, the platform as well. Right. Um, so you went through some of the challenges and whatnot and, you know, the political will and the financial challenges. Can you tell us what you think the key ingredients were for success in Sackville? Like, what was it that pushed us over the edge to be able to make it happen? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the biggest component um, related to that, that that really pushed it over the edge um, was, you know, all the work that had been done uh, as a foundation before this came to be. Um, so there was a lot of work done um, by groups like Young People and who I mentioned in terms of setting up um, collaborative groups to talk about climate change a number of years ago. Um, we've had a focus in the community as well on talking about climate grief and climate anxiety as well. There's been little pieces of work that's really come together, um, flood mapping as well, you know, set down that foundation. And so I think at a general level, everybody, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people in the community kind of understand that climate change is a concern here and that, you know, there is some action that's required. But I think what really kind of got the snowball rolling was, was the youth climate strikes. And that's why, you know, a big component of what we're doing is trying to elicit input and feedback and 
participation from youth in all of this, um, because really it came from them in terms of really, really pushing for that, uh, for that option. Great, that's great to hear. Yeah, the youth are starting to take more, more action all across the country, I think. Exactly. So this particular model and having kind of a mayor's round table, do you um, see this as a role that could help support mitigation and adaptation in other areas, particularly sort of where climate change support is limited? Because, I mean, there are those political and financial constraints, but is this a model that you think could work in other places or what, what aspects of it would be best used across Canada? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think in areas where there may be less support for climate action, for example. I think that it is, it is a model that, that can work. I think that there's a lot to be said about the local government level um, being a really, really great uh, vehicle for implementing climate action. Um, and I think that having some sort of roundtable or some sort of group that, um, you know, not necessarily criticizes, um, what the town is doing or what's in the capital budget to really work closely with the town on offering that support um, can, can be a really, really big um, influence and benefit. And I think that a lot of times as well, what we noticed with, with the public forum is that there were a lot of people who were interested in just hearing about what other people's ideas were. Um, so, you know, we had the mayor of Amherst, for example, over during the public forum who provided a talk um, on... The, the efforts that, that the, the town of Amherst has done as well are related to climate change. And so it's a lot of that being able to facilitate the information sharing. So I think that at a very basic level, if there's an opportunity to at least have that discussion with maybe one counselor or with the mayor um, in your particular community, I think that having a small group just to get things rolling and started um, is something that uh, can, can be a really, a really big impact in, in the long term. And that's, and that's what we're seeing. Great. We have a related question that's shown up from Leah Barry. If you could do it again, would, would you do anything differently? Mm. Other than starting sooner, um, I think one thing that the group has kind of talked about, if we, if we could do it again, question, um, would actually, you know, obviously at a macro level starting, at, you know, 10 years ago would have been great. But starting a little bit earlier um, in the process of budget consultations would have also been really nice. Um, so, you know, just given, obviously, everyone's busy schedules, that was challenging. But I think that timing of things would have been really good. So we could have timed, um, you know, the start of the roundtable, you know, to when the capital budget was just first being uh, looked at. Um, so we could provide a little bit more uh, perspective before some of the projects were already proposed. And in, same thing with the forums. If we had just had a little bit more time to structure that, um, that would have been really good. Um, and I think in terms of doing stuff differently as well, I think that really that focus on the long-term sustainability piece is something that I'm sure some of the folks on the roundtable would have liked to look at um, even before we started. Um, you know, have those first couple meetings to go things out, but then have a subgroup immediately take on that task of, yeah, you know, what are we going to look like two years down the road and what's the organizational uh, structure going to look like? So I think that if we were to do it again, um, I can see different folks on the roundtable thinking that we should, um, you know, develop subgroups really early on, maybe a subgroup on um, developing the public forum ideas, a subgroup on um, doing the recommendations, and a subgroup on the long-term sustainability. Thanks. That can help motivate people to get started. I guess the expression is, you know, what... When's the best time to plant a tree? Is 20 years ago. The second best time. <laughs> so get started as soon as you can. Uh, there's another question from Ronald Furlong in Amherst, Amherst Chamber of Commerce. Uh, what would you like from us? Not sure if that's something to answer online or to take that up with him afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ronald, maybe that'd be something that, that we can follow up about afterwards um, in terms of, you know, what we might be able to collaborate on in terms of uh, between Amherst and Sackville with, with the initiative. I know that when um, the mayor of Amherst came over to the public forum, he was a really great uh, resource and proposed a lot of really great recommendations that I know the town is pursuing as well. Um, so I think that would be a good um, opportunity to probably have a discussion with a few members of the town table about you know, how we can encourage that, that cross-border 
collaboration a little bit more in in the context of this project for sure.